what, uh, what we will not cover is, uh, what we don't plan to cover is that there are some tasks for using maps in DHS2 that are not used by the, we are now, if for this one, we are targeting more the end user uh, who would like to create maps more than the system administrators. So there are some tasks like, for example, upgrading DHS2, which is like lots of considerations. So we recommend, uh, especially for the workshop, that you are on version 230 or above. Higher the better for us. And then, um, of course, if you don't have this version, you can all also try the, the our demo instances. And then it is quite important that you have an organization unit hierarchy with coordinates, with poly, yeah, with coordinates. So you can actually have something to, to add, aggregate your data to and add to your map. And this is described in the docs here. And also if you would like to use the uh, Google Earth engine layers that we provide, we would recommend you to, to sign up for a Google service account. You don't need to do that as an end user. This is, your, this is something you, like the system administrator do for their DHS2 instance or, or organization. So I, I recommend to have a look at this too, and then before and have this in place before the, the workshop on 29th of April. And if you have any problems with uh, achieving this, just reach out to us in this community channel and we will try to, to help out. But we won't cover this all together because it's just relevant for, for a few of you. So why do we make maps? Um, maps are really great to, of seeing how things vary across uh, a region. So, and very often it, they can reveal patterns that we can't really or it's really hard to see in a graph or, or in a table. So in a previous GIS Academy, we created this malaria map of Bhutan. Uh, I'm not saying that this is an accurate map, it's more just add for demonstration, but here we have highlighted an area where there is a, a malaria risk. And this is made out of uh, elevation data. So I think the, yeah, so you can see the malaria risk zone is below 1,700 meters. And trying to sort of describe where these areas are in the chart or in the table or in words are quite difficult. But even you can see the, the maps, you will e easily see where these areas are. Um, and it's, uh, they can contain a lot of information that this is a quite small map, but at the same time it contains, really contains uh, a lot of information. And also something special with maps is that you can uh, add these different layers of information. So here, for example, we have like a base map. So you can see malaria risk zone might be very connected to the altitude. So you can see the mountain ranges and the valleys. And here we also add the district boundaries on top that help uh, users to orient themselves and, and also the, the district names. So what we often talk about when we talk about maps, uh, when we create them ourselves are map layers. So map layers are often have uh, one topic and then we add these different topics on top of each other to, to create a full map. So, and so, and because often we don't want, of course, we make abstractions all the time or we try to simplify things because there's some things we want to, to emphasize. And, and then we simplify the real world. You can see depicted at the end here. And then we create all these kind of different layers and then add them on top of each other to, to create a map. And also the Maps app and the previous GIS app is, is built around this layer metaphor. So what makes a good map? Uh, it's very important to think about the audience all the time. Who's going, if you're only making maps for yourself, it might be okay, but most often you will present the map to someone or share it. And then it's very important to think about your audience and what is, what is the story? What is the purpose of the map? 
quite often I see because you have this great power with all these different map layers of map data that you can add that I often see maps like the top here. People just add uh, all kind of information because they have the possibility. And then, but it, then it's impossible to read what means this number, what are the symbols, uh, it's, it's too busy. So go for simplicity, uh, like the map at the bottom, provide a legend so you can see what the map is, the title map is about, how you should read it. So don't overwhelm the audience, try to, to keep it, uh, it simple. And often I think it's, it's better to present multiple maps than having everything in, in, in one map. And then it's also a rule we'll talk more about later. It's important to, to normalize your data that you have a denominator or it's per capita when you are comparing districts. Um, also with research shows that people have a great trust in maps. When people see a map, they often think they, they give a accurate picture, but it's basically you can tell every every story with a map. There is a very popular book called How to Lie with Maps, uh, giving, <laughs> showing lots of places that some, sometimes in on purpose, other, others it's just doing the wrong thing. So basically you can tell whatever story you would like to tell, you can you make the numbers look better by just changing the colors and, and so on. So, so don't, <laughs> misuse this, uh, try to be truthful, uh, and also tell the user when there is uncertainty in, in your data. And also that's also we are having these uh, webinars here is that it's a very good opportunity for you to provide feedback. We also learn a lot when we look at how you use the Maps app. It's a bit more difficult now online, um, but uh, we will do our best to, to gather feedback and then always try to, to improve uh, the maps app if we see we lack something. So now I'm going to introduce the, uh, the, the app. Uh, just briefly before, you can see that we are adding quite a few new features for every release. I've added a number of participants here in the in the last column, so you can. So, I saw that 23 of the people signing up were on the 235. Most are on 233 and 234. So we will uh, come back to this one, but this will sort of see what sort of features we are demoing that you can use, uh, or uh, or not. So. But already at like at least 233, we have quite a good coverage of, of features that we will present today. Uh, yes, so now I will switch to the Maps app. I will start on the dashboard. So to open a Maps app is like how you uh, open other apps. It's very often placed here at the top. You can also search for it. Um, if you don't have the Maps app, if I switch back to this one, uh, some of you have been in the, using DHS for a long time. You are used to the, sorry. You are used to the old GIS app. This was completely removed in 233. So after that one, you can only use the maps app. Before that, you might have, you can see uh, both the maps and the GIS app. I would recommend then using the, the maps app. So, and we will not cover since the old GIS app is no longer in use uh, or it's not, no longer supported. We will not cover that in this, uh, this webinar, only the, the Maps app. So you can click on this one. And then we are entering the Maps app. I will briefly explain the interface you see here. So everything is centered around the map that you will always see 
uh, in the middle. And then we have the interpretations panel to the right, which is the same we have for as we have for other uh, other analytics apps. Then we have a data table, which is a table view of the same data that you can see in the map that you can open at the bottom. We will show you later. And then at the, on the left-hand side, we have all the different map layers that you have added to your map showing. And then at the top, we have the main menu. Uh, so we will go through all of them, but this is like the big overview of the, of the user interface. So I will start by opening a map that is already saved. So I go on file and open. And then I can select ANC1 coverage for chiefdoms this year. And then the map is loaded. It automatically zooms into the, to the content. And then you will have the, if there are any interpretations for this map, you will see them by toggling this button here in the menu top bar. So normally I keep this close, but if I want to see if there are any interpretations or discussions around this map, you can open it here. And then on the left hand side, we have the, the layers panel. Normally I think this is where all the action and descriptions, so I keep this panel open. But if you need more space on your map, you can also uh, toggle this one by clicking on this button. And then the data table, it's per layer. So for, and there, then there is a layer menu showing here. We call this a layer card here for this layer showing. So you can click on this button and then select data table. And I will show you how this can be used later, but then you will see all the data shown here in a, in a table format. Now I will close it again. Uh, and then we have some, I think most of, um, I'm sure you have used Google Maps and other mapping applications, and we use the same way of navigating a map that has become very popular. So you can just drag the map to, to move around. You can use the scroll wheel to zoom out or zoom in. You can also double click to zoom in. And then also we have some zoom buttons here that you can uh, zoom in and out in, in steps. Uh, there is also like a helper button here. If you have zoomed far in and then you want to zoom out to see the whole country, you can, or the whole, all of your data, you can zoom to content by clicking this and you will go back out. Uh, I will also show you two other tools that we have. One is the, the full screen mode. So, if you want to only see your map in full screen, you can click on this button and you will have all the available space on your screen. And one important feature, I know in the beginning, the first versions of the map set, we didn't have a download feature, but now it's, uh, we had it for many releases. And uh, so you can always download a map. Um, then you will have the possibility, depending maybe on this, your shape of the country, where you would like to place the legend, if you would like to see a title or not. Uh, and then you can just click download. This works best in, in Google Chrome. We normally recommend always to use Google Chrome with, with the Mapbus app and also DHS2 in general. Uh, so we click download. And then you will have an image of your map that you can use in your presentations or documents or whatever. There are also two other useful tools. I just, often I use, when I just want to clear the view, I go on file and, and new to have a, a clean map. So we have a search tool here. So if you want to go to a specific place, these are often more faster than zooming, especially if you don't know where, the, where it is. So I would like to go to Malawi, to Blantyre. And then if you click, you will get some suggestions and then you can select one of them. And then we will zoom to, 
to that city. Uh, what I would like to show you here is that we provide different, we call them base maps, like different backgrounds. So by default, we have one that is called OSM Lite. OSM means OpenStreetMap, which is a popular uh, uh, mapping provider with quite good coverage uh, in the regions where DHS2 operates. Um, and we use this as a default because you can see it's, it's quite light and bright. So because very often your purpose is to show data on top. You want to show your own health data on top. So we don't want to, the background to be too noisy and busy. So th that's why this is the default. But we also have a more detailed map uh, where you can more easily see, see different types of facilities, buildings, uh, roads are more visible and so on. So you can switch between them after the, your, your purpose of the map. Uh, we used to have uh, Google, some support for Google Maps. Uh, sadly, because of licensing restrictions, we can't provide Google Maps like this. I know they, we are, we are discussing with them and they might come back in a, at the later stage. There are also some technical limitations. So, so we had to, to remove them for not violating them. There are some restrictions also. So, uh, but at the replacement, we added the uh, lay map layers from Microsoft Bing. So you can see here is an alternative for showing mainly roads. And then the satellite imagery for, for Bing is, uh, is quite good. Uh, so here you can see, zoom in and see aerial images for, for Blantyre. There is also another one which is including uh, labels on top so you can see the name of the roads and so on. So while I'm having this, I'm going to show you the, the last tool we have here on the right side. And, and that is a measurement tool. So if you want to measure the distance uh, or area in the map, you can use this. So we click the button and then we can click the map and then we can start drawing and measuring a line. So while we are drawing, you can see the distance here. So the distance I measured here is about half a, a k kilometer. And then if I continue around this uh, group of houses, I can then finish. I can see that this is area is about six uh, hectares uh, large. So this can be uh, useful, not so much with your own data, but for the, this detailed imagery and to measure areas, this can be a quite, quite useful tool. Okay. Uh, I will not cover the, this file menu at the detail, but um, this is the same for different analytics app. And the most important thing here that we will use is a uh, new map if you want to, to start on a new with a blank blank canvas. And then uh, open if to save us, open a save map, and then you can save or save a copy or delete it later on. And you have some sharing and translating options uh, as well. So I talked about the download. Uh, the different base maps that you can can select. You will have a link to these slides afterwards. So you can go in there to, to see. Uh, I didn't present the scale bar, but also as you zoom in, you will see the scale bar at the lower left of your map. The place search, which I recommend to use. You can also use, if you have a coordinate for, but you don't have a place name, you can also uh, paste in the coordinate latitude and longitude format, and then it will zoom to that coordinate. And then the, the measurement tool. So now we are ready to add new layers. So I go back to the maps app. So we will start with a clean map and then add a new layer. So these are the layers we provide. 
the top row here is layers for your own DHS2 data. And then we have some global available data that we load from something called the Google Earth Engine, but they are provided by different international organizations. I will talk about them later. Uh, but so at the beginning now, we will start on this. We have sort of arranged them after the one that was maybe the most important. So we will spend the most time on these two. Uh, but right now I will start at the other end because these are the, the two facilities and boundaries are the easiest and simplest layer to have an easy start. So we'll click on the boundaries and then you can select which boundaries of your organization units you would like to show. So I, with my use, I often go for a level district. So I would like to see the district levels in Sierra Leone where we have the demo data. So we can just click on this and then add layer. We will zoom to the area automatically and you will see the districts. So when you have added a layer, often you want to, to, to edit it afterwards. So then you can just click on the edit button here or you can use the more actions and have a, a, a menu of layer actions that you can do and you can click edit layer. So if I want to add another level, uh, I will add the next, the chiefdom level below district. I just click on this one and again, update the layer and you will have the, the two with two different colors here. Also, we can restrict the view. So if you don't want to focus on the whole country, but maybe only the the district where you are working, you can select one district and then the same will apply and then update layer. And we will only have the district of bow with the chiefdoms inside. Then we also have a style tab. So not so many possibilities for this layer, but you can add the labels to your districts, which can be, be useful. I'll increase the size a bit and then update. And then you will see here the, the labels. Um, there are some other tools here uh, for the layer. So one thing is that you can toggle the visibility of the layer on and off. So no, I don't want to do it for this layer, but to make the, la the labels more visible, I can turn out of the, the background and only show show the map like this. The other possibility is to have it on, but then you can uh, change the opacity so you can make the layer brighter. So you can still sort of show it, uh, but but uh, not, not so busy as when you have, especially when we have these or these, it can be really hard to, to read the labels if you don't change the opacity. Okay, so that is the district level, the district uh, uh, or the boundary layer, briefly. Uh, I will create a new map and then we can go to the facility layer, which are good for showing your health facilities or anything that is, is connected to a single, not a area, but a single point in, in, in play. Yeah. So we'll select a new facility layer. Then to show this, you need to select an organization unit group set. So all your, your facilities are, depending on the setup, grouped into different group sets. So here we can select the facility type. And then we need to select the organization units you want you would like to, to see which on which level if i just add this layer i will get a, a message that i haven't selected any organization units so the maps app doesn't know what to show so you need to select your level where your facilities are so here it's also named facility so we'll click on that one and then add the layer 
So here you have all the facilities in Sierra Leone. Again, if I would like to only see one district of Bo, for example, I can select this one and then update the layer and I will only have these. And then we also have some styling options. So the icons you see here, I think I had it. Um, so when you are defining your organization groups in the maintainer, there is another app called the maintenance app where you can define your uh, organization groups and then you can assign different icons. So this can be changed. So that will be also not something the end user is doing, but something the, the, when you set up the, the system. But you can do some uh, other styling here. So if you click on the style tab, uh, we can add labels to the, to the map. And there is also a possibility to add a buffer. So you, if you, for example, would like to see what is the area, if you go five kilometers from the facility, which area would you would you cover? So I will turn on that one. You can change this uh, this number. So maybe we can reduce it to three thousand. And then update. You should see that we have added a name, and then you have the buffer around it, seeing how far you reach, three kilometers from the facility. So that's was what I plan to say about the facility layer. We will move on. I go and create a new. So now it's time to look at the thematic layer, which you use to show, I think this may be the layer at least I use the most, uh, because this is where you, you map all your aggregated data to see the results for different uh, different districts. So for this layer, there are quite a few options of things you can select, but we also try to keep it simple and also that you can, it should be easy just to create a layer and then you can edit and change it later on to sort of adapt it to your need. So the, the minimum requirements for adding a new thematic layer is to select what indicator or data elements you would like to, to map. So by default, we are, indicators are selected. You can also select data elements, reporting rates, event data items, and program indicators. So, but now we go for an indicator and then you select an indicator group as there can be a lot of indicators. And so we will have a look at malaria. And then we will look at those who have slept under a, a bed net last night. You can also select how the data should be aggregated by this. I won't go into details here, but uh, I normally use the one that is defined for the data elements in use, but you can, can uh, try the others here. And then, so the only thing you really need to select is to select an indicator and then add the layer and it should just go with the rest of the default values um, and then show them. So if this is the map, you can see a darker color means a higher rate of sleeping under bed nets. If I stand it correctly. Uh, if you go and edit, and then we can look at the period. So by default, this is also something you can set up for your instance. You can have a default period, the one that you maybe use the most to automatically be selected. So for this instance, this is the last 12 months. So this is a relative period. We also have fixed period. So if you want to look for a specific month, you can select the monthly period type and then select the month you would like to look at. And you also have the possibility to select start end dates uh, for your indicator. But now I will go back to relative. And then 
for the relative period, I will go for last, let's have last six months. And then update. So now we have changed this only this map from for the la from last 12 months to last six months. But we also have some other options here for period. And these are, are uh, let me check. So these are from two th uh, uh, 33. You should have this display periods option. So by default, and this everybody supports this, that they we just aggregate. So you have all the data, aggregated data for the six months and then show the results. But uh, if you have two uh, maps, 233 and a bow, you can also select to view the map as a timeline. So if I select the timeline, update the layer, then you will have a timeline here at the bottom. And we will not show all six months together anymore, but we will show the data month by month. And if you click on the play, it will loop through the different months. You see some arguments, we don't have data for that particular month. And you can see how it changed. You can also you can also just click here, so you can switch between the different months and see the change. Still, it can be a bit hard uh, to see this way because you sort of need to memorize how it was the month before. So, for this reason, we have also added another period display period type, and that is um, split map views. So instead of just having one map it will create one map for each month. So we can add this here and then you will have a side by side view. So you can very much more easily see how if you're interested in one uh, district, you can easily see how it changes from month to month. And these maps here are synchronized. So when you zoom into one map, it, it will do the same with all of them. So they that you can easily compare all the way. Um, there is also a possibility here to, to show um, to, that you can, something we call drill down. So instead of having to go back and create a new map, if you are only interested, if you see that, oh, this, is a, it, this has bad data or, or low numbers, and you want to see how is it within this district, you can right click on the map and select drill down one level. Then it will do the same for all maps. You can zoom in a bit and you will see the chief domes within the districts and still have the same uh, split map view. So now I will go back to the single map again org units, I will still have chiefdoms. This is the same org units we have shown before. And then I will go and see. Let's drill up again. So we will have the, the full country. Sorry. Um, So we have the full country on, on chiefdom levels. Uh, there is a new tab here that you can also add a filter to your data. So for example, just to give an example, if you would like to only show data from facilities having a specific facility ownership. So I can select facility ownership and then I'm only interested in not private clinics, but public facilities. So I can select this one and then update the layer. And then we will only see data from public facilities within this uh, indicator. Now we'll go back to the filter. I will remove it to show all and then to the last tab where there is also quite a few options. Um, what you can see here, you have the legend to the left. And uh, uh, by default, if there is, you, what you can have, can have in, in DHS2 is that you can have predefined legends. 
So you can define the legend. Now, now these legends can also be used in, in the data visualizer wrap. And so you can have this predefined legend. And often when you create an indicator, they might be the same legend you would like to use all the time. So if you select predefined legend, you will see all these different legends here that are created for your instance. Uh, so by default, this will be selected for your indicator. But for this specific malaria indicator, there was no predefined legend. So then we have something called an automatic legend, or it's also a legend that you can change yourself. But by default, uh, this legend will divide your data into, we call it classes. So uh, by default, this is divided into five classes. And we use a classification method calling equal intervals. And that means that from the mean and the max value, we, we divide your data into, into equal space. So from this, this is the mean value, this is the max value, and then it's about six uh, percentage, for example, between each of these. And then you can also see in parentheses here, we will have added the org unit, so you can see how many falls into the different class. So we have equal intervals, and then we also have equal counts. So if I switch to that one with this, this uh, having the same color scale and number of classes, it might change the view a little bit because here, instead of having equal gaps between equal size of the class, like it's 6% gap between each, this one will make sure that you have the equal number of org units or facilities within each class. So you can see one is, has 31 here, but else is 30 in each, each of these class. But then you will see that like the lowest class is almost 30 percentage big. And then the next one is 12. So, so and also back to this, this is, uh, and in a way you can make your data maybe look better or, or worse. If for example, a dark color is, is bad. So use this with, with care. Uh, but you have these two options to, to classify your, your data. I will go back to equal intervals. I normally prefer that one. And um, I will update the layer to demo the data table. So here you can see that we have two in the highest range here, two org units. What I discovered while I was, or I can show you open the, we opened the data table for this. So select this menu and data table. And this is, as I mentioned before, a line listing or table view of your own data. And it's connected to your map. So whatever you change filter or change something here, the map, it will reflect on the map. So one thing is that you can search for a specific uh, org unit. So if you just start talk, typing, for example, here, it's all org units uh, containing both. You can also go on the value. So if we only want to see uh, below 50%, for example, if this was percentage, we, we can below uh, less less than and then the number and you will see those org units falling within this range or 60 you will have more uh, you can also sort this uh, so if you click on the column header here you will can sort uh, the table ascending or descending so you can easily see which one has the best uh, value We have made some improvements uh, in the last version. So actually, in, I will demo it later. When you hover the, the row here, it will also highlight other maps so you can easily see where the different places are, are located. Uh, 
So this is what we call a choropleth map, where we add color to all the district that reflects the value. And if you use this mapping type, it's quite important that your data is normalized. So for example, it's per capita, because you will often compare across districts. And if these are total numbers, for example, numbers of, of COVID cases, for example, uh, it, it could give the wrong picture if it's not normalized, because you need to take into account the, the population, of course, uh, when you look at the number. So, so this map type is not recommended to view raw numbers, total numbers. So in 235, we added support for something called bubble maps. It's also often called proportional symbol maps that you can use to show total numbers. So I will create a new map, add layer, thematic, and then often like the indicators will be uh, normalized. You have a denominator population that you, that you use while data elements are often totals. So I will select a data element and then again, I will select a malaria indicator. And let's look at malaria referrals. So I select that one period can still be last 12 months. Again, if I just add this, it will look like this. And um, here again, it looks like there are many more referral, malaria referrals in, in this district and the neighbor district, but this could also be, be due to the population or other reasons. So normally we don't recommend to view the, show the data like this. Instead, you go on style and you select a bubble map. So instead of shading the whole district, if you select bubble maps, we will add these circles. So, and these are scaled uh, again, according to your data. And you can see the, the legend over here. So you can change some of this, um, uh, for example, the size of the, we can increase this to 50. Uh, you can also, again, for this one, maybe you don't want, because the size is representing the value, maybe you don't want to have color in addition. So we can just switch to, to single color and then update the layer. And it will look like this. And this don't give the same impressions that, that of course, you will see bigger bubbles some places than another, but it don't give the, the, the same impression of this abrupt, these changes between uh, the districts. Again, for this layer, we can have some labels and then update, the, add them to the map. Yes, so I think that was the most important thing for the thematic layer. Uh, I would like to, I was wondering if there are any questions so far? Yeah, there are a couple of questions, Ruan. Um, they, they had more to do with some of the things you demonstrated a little earlier, but they came in very recently. Um, so the first one, which is a good question, um, is how do, how do you make boundary layers update based on your organization unit filter in the dashboard? Um, so we didn't talk too much about uh, uh, plugins on the dashboard. Um, but this is an inter interesting point. And, and I think the answer is that they, they are not reflected by the um, in the org unit filter on the dashboard today, that the boundary layers. Hmm. Um, but maybe you have a, a, a more nuanced answer to that. No, that is true. So, so but that is uh, something we could add if that is something we should should look into. Yeah. But the thematic layer um, should, should update according to the filters. Yeah, so I can I can actually demonstrate that if you let me share my screen very quickly. Yeah. Okay, so this is a 
a just simple map that I have added to a dashboard. And uh, as you can see, I've, I've, I've included a filter here to filter this map and, and all the other items that would be on this dashboard to the organization unit Bo, which is a district in Sierra Leone. And if I remove that filter, we'll see that it goes back to showing the entire uh, country of Sierra Leone. And we have in this map that we've saved uh, in the maps application, we have both the uh, boundary layer. Uh, as you can see here, this is the boundary of each uh, uh, chiefdom. And then we also have a thematic layer, which Matt, uh, Bjorn has demonstrated uh, shows, um, in this case, we have the ANC visits um, per clinical prof professional. Um, if we now go to add a filter for organization units, you can go down to, uh, let's do Bombali this time. Uh, and now we can confirm that. So now this will uh, restrict the um, thematic layer on, in this map to the Bombali district. And we can see the Bombali district in the, as the boundary here as well. Um, but we, uh, you'll see that you still see the boundaries for the other chiefdoms and um, districts in your, uh, in your country. Um, or in your organization unit tree. Um, this is actually quite useful in, in many cases, potentially to be able to see the context of, of where, you're, where you're looking. Um, but if that is something that um, uh, interferes with someone's use case, I think it'd be good to, to learn about that. Cool. Um, and then there was one other question that I saw. Oh, there's two, two more questions now. Um, maybe Bjorn, I'll turn it back over to you to, to answer these. Um, but the first one is, uh, was sort of answered, but um, is it possible to drill up in the map? Yeah, so I can show you again the, the drilling. If I just open a map here, take the first one. So if you right click again a district and then... Um, we're, we're not actually seeing your screen anymore. Uh, sorry. If you can share it again. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you see it now? Thank you. Yes. So I just open the map here, and then if you right click, uh, you have this drill down. So you don't have drill up here because there is no. Uh, uh, we don't have a like a country polygon for for Sierra Leone in the demo database, but you can drill down, and then when you have drilled down, you can always drill up again one level. So you can drill down, and then also you can go further down depending on your hierarchy. So you can even go to the, to the individual facilities here and see their values. I think the other question was that if you could display the values in the map, unfortunately not currently. So that is also something we could add support for. You have it on mouse over. Uh, you can only turn on to see the names, not the, the values uh, for that particular org unit. Yeah. And that question was specifically about bubble maps. Um, so that yeah. is, uh, yeah, you can you can visually see the value, but you won't see that actual number presented in the map at this point. Hmm. Okay. If anyone else else has any questions, please uh, feel free to raise them now. Um, we'll be moving on, uh, I believe, to event layers next. Seems like I don't see any at the moment. Okay. I will be sharing my screen here to uh, demonstrate some um, event layers, which is the next um, one in the list here. I'm going to go ahead and start with uh, the slides just because we can. Um, this is just an example of an event layer, and I'll show you how to build this in a minute. Um, but there are a lot of different things that an event layer can do. Uh, and we'll talk about what those are uh, here as we go along. Um, as Bjorn mentioned, there are multiple different layer types. Here's another example of an event layer. I'm going to go ahead and, uh, that, and in this case, just as a demonstration, uh, this is showing the malaria case registrations in Sierra Leone. And I've added a filter for only showing the uh, malaria case registrations for uh, people that are under the age of five. Um, we have a, a legend here as well. In this case, we only have 
the events themselves, which are all black dots in this case, um, but we can edit that as well. And this is showing over the last 12 months. So you can see for all of these different layer types, as you make changes to your configuration for that layer, uh, you'll see that reflected in this card for that layer to demonstrate what the, uh, the, the context or the, the, um, the values that you're seeing on the map actually represent. Let's go ahead and delete this um, layer so that we start with a fresh map again. And now we're going to create an events layer. So as, as Bjorn mentioned, the, we had the boundaries layer on the right here, the facilities layer, and then the thematic or chlorofleth layer on the left, which is for aggregate data. Um, we can also look at uh, ev individual events that have been registered in the DHS2 system. This is distinct from tracked entities, which are associated with oftentimes an individual uh, um, patient or person, um, but, uh, but a tracked entity, entity does not need to be a person or a patient. It can also be something like a, a focus area for a particular uh, longitudinal study or a, um, a, a building even. Anything that you want to keep track of an individual over time that uh, is a tracked entity uh, instance in DHIS2. And we can represent both of those on maps in the Maps app as different layers. I'm going to focus initially on events which are not affiliated with an individual. Um, these are just recorded as something that uh, we can see, uh, so something that happened at a certain point in time and also at a certain point in space, which we'll, we'll see demonstrated here. So I'm going to click on the event layer. And similar to the, the, the thematic layer that Bjorn demonstrated, uh, we have a number of tabs here to select the, the data and how we want to display it. Uh, for event layers, we have to select the event program that we want to represent here. So I'm going to pick um, malaria case registration that has a lot of events. Um, so it's a good kind of demonstration here, but there are others that have um, Fewer, fewer numbers of events, and we can see how we might uh, display those in different ways. For You can also select the stage of a particular program. In this case, there's only one stage for malaria, uh, the malaria program in this, in this database. Um, and you can also do uh, some more advanced things that we won't get into too much here, but you can select different uh, fields that where the uh, location to, to plot on the map is located. In this case, we're going to select where the event actually took place. So this is where the malaria case was registered, but that might not be the same as the household location of the person that was uh, registered as a malaria case. So uh, having the household location would show a different location on the map for the same event. Um, and that depends a lot on how you configure your event program in DHS2 in the maintenance app in particular, and how you capture that data in the capture application. Similarly, we can also select a period here. Uh, sorry, the last one here on in the data tab is uh, the stage of the, uh, or sorry, the status of the program that we are talking about. So we're gonna go ahead and go with all, but you could also show only the active cases or active events, the only the completed, um, et cetera. In the periods tab, we have a again the the same options as the thematic layer. You'll see that start and end dates is up here at the top because that might be particularly interesting for an event layer. Unlike a thematic layer, these are not aggregated uh, values. So the last 12 months will show every event that happened in the last 12 months, not a, a, an aggregate of that information over the last 12 months. Um, that's important to keep in mind. So we're going to go ahead and do the last 12 months, but we could also similarly say the same thing, start and end date. So this is uh, automatically set uh, the start date to one year ago today and the end date to today, and that will give you the same information. Let's go ahead and do um, the last 12 months here. Again, we can see, we can select the org unit that we want to specify. I'm gonna keep it at the default here with Sierra Leone. You can also specify uh, the org unit based on the organization unit up, um, defined for this particular user. So whoever, whoever is logged in um, as your, the user of this mapped application, you can also specify that that organization unit that they have been assigned, the ones uh, one level below that or two levels below that. 
Um, similar to the filter that Bjorn demonstrated, um, we can add a, a filter to this layer. I'm going to go ahead and do that here because the uh, the malaria events have about 100,000 points in this database. So there are quite a few, and that can get, get quite um, uh, busy in a map. Um, you can render them, and I'll show you that in a minute as well. But for now, I'm going to start with a, a little bit of a simplification. So I'm going to show all of the um, Asian years less than five for these malaria case registrations. Uh, and then we'll get into more about what you can do with this, the style tab for this layer type. Uh, it's quite powerful. Um, but for now, we'll leave this as grouped events. Um, and we'll, we'll go back and edit this layer to, to show you how, how you can um, change, change the display of the event layer. Let's go ahead and add this layer now. So as you can see, this does what's, uh, what, what it says on the tin effectively. Um, in the style tab, we have, group, we have selected group events. So you can see in this map, we, the, the events are grouped by their location. Um, and there are uh, a, 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 basically each group um, is in a number of events that actually happened somewhere in this region. So if I click on this 331 here in the middle, and then I can see that this is this is a breakdown of as we zoom in, more and more uh, events uh, appear in the regions where they occurred. Uh, this type of um, uh, kind of collect, uh, grouping of events is very useful for large databases where you might have uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions of events that you it's not possible to display them all on the map from the from the highest uh, zoom level for this particular map. So we can get down, as you can see, to the individual event. So this was a four-year-old male that uh, contracted malaria at this location in Sierra Leone. Uh, the, the Sierra Leone database is, um, uh, is um, anonymized and, and kind of randomized data. So this is not necessarily reflective of what you would see for the registration point for a malaria case. Um, but you can see that this, may, maybe you could uh, demonstrate that this happened uh, along this river. Maybe there was a particular outbreak um, uh, or a number of cases of malaria in this region for that reason. Um, there are still a few groups here and we can zoom down into the, the individual points. Once we get down to a very low zoom level, it's this is, doesn't give us a lot of context. So we can, again, change the base map to something that shows a little bit more information. Let's go ahead and turn on um, the aerial map. Um, in this case, we're in the middle of a field uh, in, in a, um, a rural area. Um, so there's not a lot of labels going on, but this does give you a pretty good idea of exactly where this event took place. All the way to our, uh, our top level where we see these groupings. Um, and these groupings, are useful, but they they can kind of disguise a little bit some of the information that we're that we're trying to see. So let's go ahead and edit our um, our layer here. Uh, we can also select to, uh, to view all of the events in this particular program. So this will show us all of the malaria case registrations in the last twelve months for the country of Sierra Leone in this database. Um, and we're going to go ahead and turn that on. So this will instead of showing groups of events. This will show us every single event as, a, as an individual point. Uh, and you can see that this is um, a smaller number of events than we've seen previously um, uh, in, in the example that I showed earlier. And that's because I have this filter here. But this is still probably something in the thousands of events, um, as we saw in the, in the groupings. Uh, and you can zoom all the way in. I know it's a little bit jerky, potentially, um, on the Zoom call to, to view this, but it is quite smooth to be able to zoom all the way in uh, and quickly see exactly where each of these events took place. Um, this is a way to get uh, kind of an idea of groupings to show the, the total overview of cases, but when you're all the way at this high Zoom level, it's not very easy to, uh, to distinguish how many events are in this region right here versus another region. And that's where the groupings might take, take um, uh, have a little bit of, of better uh, utility in showing the information that you want to convey. Let's go ahead and take this one step for, further. 
we have the option to style by data element. And what that means is for each of these registrations, as we saw when I clicked on an event for that um, uh, four-year-old male uh, malaria, case of uh, malaria, we have certain data elements that are collected when that event is registered in the system. We, in this case, for this program, we have age and years and gender, but there might be many other data elements that are collected. Um, and in this case, we're, we're, let's go ahead and disaggregate by gender. So by selecting style by data element gender, I can actually, instead of showing every registration as a black dot, I can show the ones that are male as a blue dot and the ones that are female as an orange dot. Um, let's go ahead and see how that works. So just like before, we see every uh, event um, registered as, a, as an individual point, but now we have a, a legend here on the left that shows male, female, or uh, there's, there's actually a black dot as well for um, uh, registrations that didn't specify which gender was, uh, of the, uh, which, what the gender of the patient was. Um, and we have blue for male and orange for female. And every single point has this um, value uh, or this color. Zoom in and show that there were two females in this location and one male in this location um, and really get to uh, some more information about these cases. Similarly, if we go ahead and take off this uh, filter. So previously I had specified a filter for only showing the malaria case registrations that have an age in years of less than five. So I'm gonna go ahead and delete that filter and update the layer. This is, as I mentioned, about 100,000 uh, points. So it might take some time to render, but it sh will show me all 100,000 individual malaria case registrations on the same map. Um, this is a new feature in 235, I believe, that uh, is called WebGL, and we're using that to render the maps in a much more performant way so that you can actually uh, conceivably render 100,000 uh, events on a single map and still be able to very smoothly, again, it might be um, uh, a little bit uh, disjointed in the Zoom call, but it is very, very smooth to zoom all the way in to an individual case and then all the way back out to the 100,000 uh, points that are rendered on this map at the national level. Um, and that can be quite cool. You can also get, um, uh, again, uh, get an idea for um, how useful or not useful it is to render this many points at this high of a scale. So uh, as we're looking at the entire country, th this doesn't tell us very much here in this kind of huge cluster of a lot of different malaria case registrations. Uh, and we'll show how we might be able to disaggregate that again with a, with a grouping in a minute. Um, but before I do that, I'm actually going to change this style by data element, uh, and I'm gonna change it to say age and years. So age and years, instead of having just two options, has, is, a, is a number. And uh, we can again, as Bjorn mentioned, used either, use either a predefined color legend set, uh, which is defined in the maintenance application, um, we have a predefined one for uh, a 10 year interval of ages. We also have an age of 15 years and there are many other predefined legends for different types of data. Or we can use an automatic color legend, which is similar to what Bjorn mentioned. We can select either equal intervals, which is preferred in most cases or equal counts uh, and select the number of classes uh, or different colors to show the number of different groupings um, to show in this legend. I'm going to go ahead and use the predefined legend set for age of 10 years, um, and I'm going to update this layer. This is again uh, rendering the entire database, so it's or the entire uh, set of uh, malaria case registrations for 100,000 or so in the country of Sierra Leone. And hopefully, my demo did not just break here. I will. Uh, yep, we should be okay. So it should be rendering uh, all of these case registrations. We have about 100,000 points. Um, again, it's not super useful to see all of these in, um, on top of each other from this very high zoom level. But you can see on the left here that we have uh, a, a 10 or so different um, 
categories in, in groupings of 10, eight, 10 years of age. So the very lightest color, uh, which is difficult to see on the left in the legend here, is 0 to 10. Uh, and then you have 10 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, et cetera, all the way to 90 to 100. Um, so we have, we have no malaria cases registered for people over the age of 90 or over the age of 80, but we do have a, quite a few in the 70 to 80 range in this case. Um, we can turn the opacity up and down just like um, other, other layers as we've seen before. But as you mentioned, or as we mentioned, this isn't super useful from this high zoom level. If we zoom all the way in, we can see kind of the clustering of the, uh, the different events, um, the malaria case registrations, and the, their colors represent the age. But it might not be super interesting to see uh, individual points, um, individual cases, and the age of that individual person. So instead, let's go back to our style tab. And now let's group again. So previously, we had all the, we were viewing uh, the group of events without any style by data element selected. Now, now we've been trying style by data element with viewing all the events, all 100,000 points in this case. Now let's go back to group by, uh, to the group events um, option, but we're going to keep the style by data element. So instead of seeing a black circle with a number in it that doesn't represent too much other than just the number of cases that occurred in that general region. We have a, also a style by data element selected, which will uh, group those or, or um, uh, kind of assign a color to those points when we zoom all the way in for a particular age in years. Let's go ahead and update this uh, layer again. It zooms us back out. And here we have what we call donut charts. And donut charts were introduced, I believe, in 235. Um, and they allow us to, Bjorn, correct me if I'm wrong on that, by the way. Um, they allow us to see the grouping of all of these events, but with a, a donut uh, or a, a kind of a wheel that shows how many of the, that number in that group are in each of these age categories. So we can see here that um, they're, they're fairly, fairly e evenly um, distributed, but we can go ahead and, and look at some of these individual cases. And you'll see that here we have two events and half of them are uh, younger than the other half. Uh, it's, it's hard to tell exactly what these um, numbers are, which, the, which legend they are, but when you have a, a whole range like this 117, you can see that there is a distribution of each of these age groups. If we then go all the way in, we can see that there are two points here, one for a male age 13, um, which is going to be in this second category of uh, um, color legend, and one for a male age or female age 57, uh, which is the sixth or so um, category here on the left. This is a nice way to uh, get an idea, not only of the number of events that occur in a certain place, but also how they break down in each of those regions or areas by the, uh, the some data element, in this case, age and years. So that's quite a handy uh, feature to be able to, to show. I'm gonna add one more thing in the style tab before we move on here. Um, I'm going to go back to view all events, and then just for simplicity, I'm going to add the filter again. So I'm going to say age and years less than five, and I'm going to go ahead and continue to have this uh, style by data element here. Oops. So yeah, so actually this is correct. So you can see that um, because I've set the filter to be age less than five, all of the points in this entire map are going to be in this first category of age zero to 10. So they're all gonna be the same color. So this style of data element isn't super useful for us anymore. Let's go ahead and go back to the, to the gender um, uh, disaggregation. We could also uh, specify a, an automatic color legend with equal intervals and five, and that would show us the number that are one year, two year, three year, four year, and five year, more or less. Um, but let's go ahead and do gender here instead. So now we have those uh, all of the uh, malaria case registrations for children under the age of five, and the, the color indicates whether they are male or female. 
we can add one more thing here in the style tab, and that is a buffer. So on the buffer, we could, um, is similar to the facility layer that, that Bjorn demonstrated earlier, we can have a radius of some number of meters around an individual case. Um, for a malaria case registration, this might make sense. It might, might not make that much sense, but it might give us a, um, an ability for, for a different type of event to show a, a radius of maybe 10 kilometers or something like that. Um, around a case of a particularly infectious disease to show where that it might be likely that that disease might spread. Um, that's just one example of use case. There are a lot of different use cases here, depending on what you're modeling with your event program. Um, let's go ahead and just make this one kilometer instead of, um, uh, yeah, instead of 10. Go ahead and update this layer. We see basically the same thing, but if we zoom all the way, you can see that each of these individual case registrations points has a uh, buffer around it, which is also colored with the, the legend. So this is a male. I'm going to go ahead and switch back to um, the, the normal road map so that we can see this a little bit easier. Um, but you can see that each of these has a buffer around it um, that is one kilometer uh, in radius. Um, you can also see that displayed in the legend on the left here. So that's just another tool you can use uh, depending on the data that you're using to um, uh, analyze this information in, in geographical space. Next, I'm going to show the data table, which is very similar to what uh, Bjorn mentioned about the thematic layer. So we can open up, oops, sorry, that's download data, which we will not get into today, but I, I can cover it very briefly afterwards. Um, let's look at the data table here. So as we can see, we have a table of all of the points that are on this map. Um, you can see the, the uh, data elements that are collected for each of those events. So we have the age of the, the person in question, the gender of that person, um, the color just represents whether it's male or female in this case, but it would be different colors based on whether you select um, the age disaggregation or the gender disaggregation in your style by data element uh, selection. Um, similar to the thematic layers, you can sort. So we could sort by organization unit here. Uh, in this case, the organization unit is representing the, uh, the, in, the, the place where this registration took place. So this is a, a community health uh, facility, for instance. Um, there's a health post where, where other ones were, were registered. Um, and maybe we want to only see the, uh, the, the events or the, the registrations that happened at hospitals. So let's go ahead and type hospital here. So this is a little bit, um, uh, it's, it's a little bit imprecise. It's more for kind of exploring your data and finding information about it. Um, similarly, you could use less than three in order to find the um, age and years of less than three for these, these registrations. Um, this is actually just searching the text of the name of this organization unit. So you might have a hospital that doesn't have hospital in the name. In that case, it wouldn't appear here but you could use the filter um, uh, functionality in the uh, event layer uh, configuration itself to, to uh, filter by facility type instead. Um, in this case, it's just a simple way to uh, restrict the view to only the cases that occurred in a, or a unit with the name hospital or with the word hospital in their name. Um, as you can see, as I typed this uh, filter, um, not only did we restrict the, the events that show up in this data table to only those that have hospital in their name, but we also restricted the uh, events that are appearing on our map. So in, the, in this sample database, there were not very many um, events that occurred outside of hospitals. Uh, Sorry, in hospitals, there were most of, most of the events occurred outside of hospitals. So this is a fairly small number that uh, is returned. Um, also, when you're restricting to only to hospitals, um, many of these points might show up on the same at the same place um, as to where they're registered. 
So it might be it might make sense to um, use the uh, grouping rather than the individual points um, functionality. Let's go ahead and remove this filter. You can also do this with um, all of the other uh, types of um, uh, all the other columns in this data table. Um, but it's a nice way to really uh, drill down and, and see some of the uh, information or filter the, the, the view that you're looking at um, in order to do some exploration. Let me check my notes just to see what else I was going to talk about for um, the events layer. I think that was it. Um, Bjorn, is there anything I missed there on the event layer? No, the only thing is that uh, this um, web GL that you can actually show like 100,000 events at the same map. And also the donut cluster, this was not in 235, but uh, from 234. So that should be, right. should be accessible for quite a few of you. And there's also right. a reason for to do your upgrade. Thanks. Did we have any questions that came in? Uh, there are no, uh, uh, we will, no it, there is not anyone relevant for this. So we will take that those later. Okay. Um, the last point I wanted to, to add here is we do have the option to download data for a, an event layer. So you can download a GeoJSON of the malaria case registrations in uh, the uh, with the filters and everything applied and the style of data element applied that you've uh, used in this map. Um, you select the um, the ID that you want to use to identify each of the uh, individual events. Um, you can use ID or code. You can use human readable keys rather than the like ID identifier values. Um, and we can go ahead and download that. Um, this might take some time, but it will download a GeoJSON file that will um, be, uh, you can you then use in, for instance, QGIS or other software to do more sophisticated analysis of your, um, uh, of your data. Um, and we're not gonna get into how to do that in uh, other GIS software, but this allows you to kind of construct the data set that you want in this, um, in this maps application, download it, and then use it in, that, um, uh, in, a, in a more advanced context. We, uh, there is one uh, relevant question before we move on. Um, sure. I guess some users are concerned with uh, downloading this much data. They already know from large pivot tables that uh, that takes time. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. and, and ask for some recommendation. What I would say here is that by default, uh, we have this grouping on. And yep. if you are not grouping by or styling by a data element, this grouping will happen on the server. So we will only download very small uh, number of data. So instead of downloading 100,000 data, we will just download uh, this uh, symbols showing that here it is 183 and and not the individual 183 events and then as you zoom in we will load more data so even on the slow bandwidth you should see that this by by just going with the default selections go pretty fast okay. uh, so the it slows down when you decide to show all events or you decide to style by a date element, because then we need all the data in the browser to be able to make this, <coughs> this uh, visualization. Uh, and of course, also like, like Austin showed that you can either restrict by adding a filter, so you don't look at the whole population, but maybe just below 20 years. And, of, and you can also restrict by org unit, so you don't go for the whole country, but, but uh, one region. Yeah. And then there is another question. Uh, it's about how more the visuals that it it might look like when you have zoomed out. We have added a little white outline around each each of the events that might look like they are sort of a little bit melting together when you you look at a very high density numbers, but they should sort of spread out as you zoom in. So if, if there are any suggestions of how we could style it differently, please please uh, suggest. Okay, keep going. Sure. 
So I just have a, a demonstration here. This is the um, uh, grouping without styled by data element. And in this case, it's very, very fast, even though we're, we're still visualizing 100,000 points in total, uh, it would be very fast to do this. And in order to, to do that, you have group by events and you have no style by data element selected. If we update that layer, it's very, very fast to download that because it's not downloading the entire 100,000 points. And you can still zoom in and get the individual points um, and it will load as you zoom in the more uh, smaller data sets um, that you can see. Cool, thank you for that, Brian. Um, another one is restricting by the um, uh, by the org unit, um, even if you have all uh, points shown. You can show only the points in a particular region, and that will restrict the, the download size. OK, so next I'm going to demonstrate some tracked entity instance layers. Um, as, as we've mentioned, this is the, the third layer type. It's um, similar to events, but you're actually visualizing something that you're tracking, you're keeping track of over time. You're, you have long, longitudinal data about a thing. It might, in most cases, it would be a person or a patient, um, but it might also be something else that you want to track uh, over, through time. Um, I've created a very simple um, representation here with, with just a few um, uh, a few um, tracked entities. Um, in this case, we're looking at focus areas for a malaria case registration program. So this is these are focus areas that are keep being kept track of by the 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 um, uh, the team that's doing the investigation of uh, malaria cases in this particular region. Um, in order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and create this again. Um, but this this is just an example of a tracked entity that is not a person that you can track, uh, keep track of over time, and you would uh, enter data for this uh, focus area in the tracked uh, tracker capture application in DHS2. I'm going to go ahead and remove that layer and add another one here. So let's go ahead and uh, focus area is what I had shown before. So you can select the malaria focus investigation for to, to view those uh, polygons that I had shown there. Uh, and that was an interesting one as well, because you could see that they weren't just points. They, they could also be more complicated shapes on the map. Um, because for a focus area, you're not focusing on a specific place. You're supposed to be focusing on an area. Uh, and in order to do that, you can create focus areas or foci that are uh, uh, polygons or uh, more complicated shapes um, in order to, to cover the area that you actually care about in, for this case. Um, I'll get into relationships in a minute. Um, you can select period for your uh, tracked entity instance. Um, unlike uh, other map types or, or layer types, you cannot select uh, relative periods or absolute periods here. You have to select a start and an end date. Uh, and this reflects the, um, uh, the enrollment of the um, particular tracked entity into this program. We can also select the uh, org unit that we care about. Uh, it's important to note that tracked entities are very often registered at a very low org unit level. So they're probably re registered at the facility level, for instance. Um, and you need to have the user that's building this map needs to have view access to those tracked or the, that org unit and tracked entity instances in that program in that org unit. So um, you often won't have uh, a national view of tracked entity instances. Um, you'll have a, a more, more tailored view for a particular region, for instance. Um, in order to, to show that, we could select all of the individual facilities, for instance, or if we knew our tracked entities were registered at the, at the chiefdom level, we could select chiefdoms. Um, but in order to make that a little bit simpler, we're going to select Sierra Leone, so the entire country, and we're going to choose selected and all below, which means all of the uh, the Sierra Leone uh, national level, all of the districts, all of the chiefdoms, and all of the facilities that this particular user has access to. Um, we have a very simple styling 
uh, selection here. Uh, again, we can select a buffer. I won't show that in this case. Uh, actually, I'll, I'll add it just to just to um, have a little bit of extra um, uh, information. We can also select the color of this particular um, focus area that we're going to be re rendering on the map. Let's make that green. Um, and point size uh, for a polygon, which is the, the focus area is a polygon and not a point. The point size won't make a difference, but this would also adjust the size of the point uh, for point layers. I'm gonna go ahead and add this layer. So as you can see, we have these three uh, uh, focus areas. Um, and if I turn this back to, uh, we can see that there's a little buffer around the entire edge of this polygon as well. If I change that buffer to be uh, um, maybe 10 kilometers or something instead, we actually have quite large areas around these polygons that show the, the areas where these, um, uh, that, that we care about for this case. Let's make that, uh, let's go ahead and get rid of that buffer because that's not, not super useful in this case. Okay, so we have these focus areas, um, but we don't get, care so much about the focus area by itself. In this case, we want to know what uh, what actual um, relationships that we have defined between that focus area and individual malaria case registrations. So we can. Uh, this is a, a a experimental feature that's been in since 234, I believe. Um, probably we'll see some uh, significant improvements in 237 and beyond. But um, what we can see is that. Uh, we can actually show the relationships between different entities on the map uh, using the relationships that are defined for this particular tract entity type. So for the malaria investigation focus area uh, tract entity type uh, and program, we have only one type of relationship defined, and that is a relationship between the focus and an individual case of malaria. We're going to go ahead and do that. And so here you can see, maybe we have some, some bad data here, but you can see that there's actually a relationship between this polygon and the three points that are within it. Um, this might not be the most um, straightforward uh, representation. There might be other ways that you could look at this data, which we will investigate in future versions of DHS2. Um, but this is just an example of showing some of those relationships. We're gonna go ahead and uh, remove this layer and create another one with a tract entity type of malaria entity, which was the, the destination type that we just saw. I'm gonna select the program. I'm going to show relationships here, but in this case, we have uh, a relationship back to the focus area, but we also have a relationship between two cases from an index case to an individual case. Um, might be particularly useful for a um, uh, communicable disease, for instance, um, like COVID-19. We can select selected and all below for our org units. We can style here. We show the, the point size in this case. Let's, let's make it a little bit larger, make it eight. Um, we could add a buffer if we wanted to, 100 meters. Um, and we can also now define the, uh, the color and the point size and the line color for the related entities in this case. So here we have it. We have uh, a index case of uh, whatever we're, we're tracking here related to uh, subsequent cases that we can demonstrate in the tracked entity instance layer. That is, uh, for now, the, the, the uh, overview of what you can do in a tracked entity instance layer in DHS2 maps application. Um, again, look for more coming soon. Um, but this is an interesting way to investigate not only uh, individual events, but entities that you track over time and how those are related to each other. I think that's it for tracked entity instance layers. Um, Bjorn, did you have any anything to add there or any questions that came up? No, I think that was good. Uh, there are no specific questions for this, so we I think we can move on. Great. So there are we are 20 minutes and two more layer types, so I think we are on time. Um, so let me share my screen again. So what I would like to demo now is that when we, now when we have added, created all these different layer types, 
I will see what you can do when you have more than one layer on your map. So at the beginning, I will just load a layer here. This is just uh, for demo purposes. So which one is not so important. And then I will add uh, an event layer on top. So I'm just selecting this program and add the layer. Uh, so here you see you have two layers. So the, the rule is that the layer you add the last uh, is always placed on top of the others. And, and the, the, it will also be reflected in this column here to the left. So at the bottom, you have the base map. And then above the base map, you have this layer, this uh, thematic layer. And then at the top, you have the event layer. But and the base map always needs to be uh, at the bottom. It's no, it makes no sense to put the base map on top of the other. It will just hide everything. So, but for these two layers here, you can easily change the order. So you, by just taking this handle and then drag it above the other. So here in this case, it really makes sense to have the event layer because above and on the top because it's not covering so much as the other. But if you are doing the other way, and then you can also change the opacity uh, of the different layers to, to reflect. But normally I would always recommend to, to place points, these points here above these uh, colored uh, shapes that we have. So, okay, and then I will move on to the next layer type, which is the row here on the second row. And these layers are from different providers, but they are all from something called the Google Earth engine. It has nothing to do with Google Earth, like the 3D globe viewer from Google. So Google Earth engine is that Google is providing their infrastructure and computing power storage, like for the, this is for the common good. So we don't need to pay anything to use this service. We need to sign up to use it, but for nonprofit use, it's freely available. And what organizations can do, for example, we will look at population density data that is from an organization called WorldPop. Uh, so they can upload the data to the Google infrastructure and then we can use it again in DHS2. So we have just added a few layers. There are hundreds of data sets uh, available. So, and if you have some specific needs, you can ask us and we will, we will try to, to add those. Um, we will also try to, to enable that you can add your own good layer from this uh, Google Earth engine later on. So you don't have only to rely on the one we have selected. Uh, this is also greatly improved in the new release coming in next month. Uh, so I will demo both what you can currently use and what the changes we have done for the upcoming release, which is quite exciting. But for now, if you want to add an elevation layer, you just click on that one. And then here you can also work with the scale because like what works maybe for Sierra Leone wouldn't work for Nepal. So you can individually set the mean and max and the color scale for, for the layer. I will just go with the default and then add the layer. So these data sets are, are having a world coverage. So you can zoom out and, and see the whole world. Um, so it can be a bit hard to orient here uh, because it's covering the base map. What uh, one thing you can do then is to add a boundary layer that we looked at before. So we can add the districts uh, and maybe also the, the labels of the districts. And then we will add that on top and then it's a little bit easier to see. So this is what you can currently do with this layer. There is one little hidden feature here in that is you can right click anywhere on the map and you can see the elevation of that particular place. So the elevation at just this point here is 1,641 meters. But this is about what you can, can do it. 
doesn't really give you the, the numbers for the org units, but give you a, a visual view of the, the elevation. And then also I got a question that because I demoed this malaria elevation map from Bhutan uh, previously, and I got a question how that could be created. Unfortunately, we don't, you can't do that in the maps app uh, yet, maybe in the future, but you can do that in another application called QGIS. And if you have signed up for the workshop, uh, we will introduce that program uh, at the end of April when we have the two days workshop, we don't have time today. But what you can do is for this elevation layer, you could try to adjust the number of steps, reduce them. And maybe you have like the malaria risk zone is zero to, to 900. For example, you can do this and update. And you will see by the colors, for example, that above 900, it's a very low risk, maybe higher risk, but uh, at this, uh, in these classes here. So this is what you can currently do in the maps app. Um, but now I'm going to move on to the latest version. So I will demo here on 236, which is soon coming. So you will see that this has, this has changed a bit. This view is quite the same. So I will also now start with the elevation layer, add it. What you then can do is that you can decide that you want to aggregate. You, want, you don't want to see this, you want to see the actual, the, the mean population, for example, within your districts, or maybe the mean on the max. We will show this for population data after that might be even more useful. But now I would like to have the mean and max elevation uh, for all my districts. You, this is the one you can select between. And then by default, we select the second organization level. So we will select this and go with the default style again. So what we are now doing, this takes more time than before because now we are actually uploading your organization units to the Google server. It will still be on their restricted server. So they won't use that data for, for other purposes, but we, we will add not individual data, but this only the boundaries will be uploaded. So it's also good to be aware that that, that data will be shared with Google. And then for each of the org units on their server, we will calculate uh, the, the elevation data. So if you click on this one, you can see that the max elevation in this district is 1,933 meters. The mean elevation is 456 and the um, minimum elevation is 72. And then you can look at this for, for all the different districts. I think this is even more useful for a layer like population. Because what you can now do, especially if you have bad census data or you have some regions where you we didn't have a census, you can actually uh, calculate that here on the fly. So we add a population layer. Uh, for population, I would just like to have especially the sum I'm interested in. I can also have the mean, which belongs to the, goes to the population density. For here, we have different periods and these are not something we define. These are the, basically the years that are provided by the, the international organization who provide these data. And for World Pop here, it's, they have data back to 2000. So you can actually also see how the population has changed over time. But now I select the most recent year. Again, I'm fine with going with the districts and I will also have the default style. So I add this. Again, it takes a little time because the, day we are, the, the calculations are not happening locally. I don't think it should be so much lower on a low bandwidth infrastructure necessarily because the data sent between DHS2 and Google are not that big, but it's um, uh, the calculations also that takes time. Because here, 
Google needs to count all these individuals' data. These are by population by 100 and 100 meters. So all of these needs to be counted within uh, your districts. So if I click on this one, I will see that the population in 2020 for this district is estimated to be 468,000. You can also, again, open the data table and you can see the population numbers here for, for all. Here you can also see a new feature we added for 236. If you just hover the table, you will see it highlighted on the map. So it's more easy to see where it belongs. And if you want to sort the population numbers, you can just click the heading. So Western area is the most populous country uh, district. Um, 1.4 million. If you only want to see with lower population than half a million, we can do like this. And then the full layer will show, but these ones are only having this value. Uh, I will remove the filter yeah, again here. You, we have, we try to have the same functionality across all layers. So if you would like to see within this district, you can drill down one layer and then see the chiefdoms instead, again with the same aggregations. So in this chiefdom, 64,000 people are estimated to live. So I th we think this can be, we have quite a few of requests of this and making it this easy to get these numbers uh, can be hopefully useful for, for many of you. What we would like to support later on is that you can import this data also to a data element. So if you have a, like a population denominator that you will use for your indicators, you can fetch these values directly from this <coughs> source uh, like WorldPop. So, but this needs, um, this needs uh, careful considerations and it's because it can have a big consequence to change the denominator for uh, for that is used for many indicators. So we need to, to do this probably and we'll probably and we we'll probably not add it to the maps app but to the import export app instead. But we hope to, to get this in place for 237. But so far you can easily see the values, you have the data table and you can also download the, the data and import it again to a uh, data element by, by other means. Um, especially for COVID, there is, was also a, re, a request for, to have this population divided into age groups, because maybe you want to start vaccination planning and see what, and see maybe about 80 years old, how many are there on this, in different districts. So we added a new population layer for 236, which have these age groups. So you can add it and then you have a new selection here. So in addition to the aggregation methods, you can select the age groups you would like to see. You can select only one, but you can also say like multiple. So maybe we would like to have women, for example, about uh, 70 years. We can have men as well. So we can have the same classes for men. So we have these six groups we select. Again, district is fine, and I will add a layer. So you will see here that the map is very bright. I will show you in a second how you can change it, but that is just because now we just have, there are quite few actually in these regions being about 70, years, men and women, so most fall into the lowest uh, class here in the, in the legend. But you can click on this and then you will see that for this district it's estimated that there are 5,732 uh, men and women above 70 years. So this could be very useful for, for vaccination planning. Uh, what our plan is that you will work mo more on this data for the workshop coming up. 
And even though you don't have 236, we will show you how you can extract this value using another program. So it's very good that most of you uh, have signed up for that one. We will also have World Pop coming and having an hour introduction to these data sets and, and explain how they are created, limitations, or if you can rely on the data uh, and so on. So, so please join the, the workshop to learn more about this. Uh, just to show you that uh, you can make this more interesting visually. Uh, so we go to edit and instead of having a, um, a legend going from zero to 10, we can have it going to zero to one. And then if we update the layer, we should see more. Or more like how it is distributed around the country. So now you can see this has a higher population here than in other places. Uh, lastly, I would like to show you that because there is also, uh, that was not really related, uh, we have these uh, districts that we call polygons. We will explain more about polygons and points and how they differ in the, in the workshop. But the, th the important thing is that the facilities, even though they maybe have a catchment area or a coverage, often they, they, you don't only have the point coordinates. And maybe you want to know the population living around a health facility. So what we have done so far is that we can go to style and then again create this buffer. So we want to know the population living within five uh, kilometers from a health facility. And then we also go to organization units. We don't want to see the whole level, but we would like to see the facilities here in this district. So I select this chiefdom and I want to see these facilities. If we done update the layer, sorry, I need to also, because now I only selected, uh, yeah, so I get this polygon because I only selected the chiefdom, but I also need to say that I want to see the facilities uh, in this chiefdom, only facilities. So I select facility level, and then update. So what we are then doing here is that we are aggregating the data to 5,000 meters distance from the facility. So in this health facility here, there is an estimated of 73 people living within five kilometers from the facility. So this is what you can currently do. Uh, in the workshop later on, we will also, see I'm running out of time now, uh, we will also show you that this can also be done by driving distance. Uh, so the last layer, I didn't plan to, um, to demo, but just to show you that you have that possibility. So I will quickly jump to that one. So we have something called uh, external layers. And um, uh, this one <clears throat> uh, allows you to add your own external layer, not only those that we have from Google Earth. So for example, you can add a terrain map if terrain is important for, for your visualizations, or you can add aerial imagery or we have created some examples here for WHO who needed to show that borders can be disputed uh, because they, there is no true uh, country border map of the world. So, so these are just some examples. We might go into more detail with this in the, um, in the workshop. Um, quick summary. Um, DSS2 maps should make it easy to create maps from your health data. We, I hope we have been able to show that. And you can just start very easy and then add more complexity as, as you go along. 
remember to make your maps easy to read. It's not necessarily to add a lot of layers, even though you have the possibility to do that. Uh, for aggregated data, you use the thematic layer. And for data about individuals, you need to focus on event and tracked entities. And then also from 236, you can aggregate data from external sources like population and elevation, even temperature and rainfall to your own organization units. Uh, this I would really recommend to use this data table more because it's an easy way to explore and, and filter your data. And then also remember that you can easily save, download your maps, export data that we will look into next uh, in the workshop. And also it's easy to add maps to your dashboard. And I just recommend to also see the user documentation where we try to, to write how you do all this. Uh, for the workshop, it's a two day workshop. Uh, to sort of to get a certificate, you need to take part three hours each day which is between 10 and one, where we will have short presentations. And then we plan that you should actually can do exercises on your own DHS2 instance or the demo instance. So we don't plan any hand-ins because there are too many participants, but uh, you need to take care in, take part in all the sessions to, to get this certificate. And then we will have after each day, one hour with questions and, and answers and try it also to divide you into at least two groups. Uh, so we will try to help you as, as much as we can. There might also be some follow-up after these two days if we see that is needed. Uh, one preparation you can do before this is to install QGIS. Uh, it's, a, it's a desktop mapping application that which is very powerful, uh, which we will use on the second day. So you can download that from QGIS.org. Alice, I hand over, to, I will just to see if there are many more questions. There is only one more question. What's the difference between polygon and multi-polygon? So this we will cover more in the, in the workshop. The short answer is a polygon is just like a single shape, but for some districts, two polygons, maybe it's an, uh, an state divided on two islands, for example and that will be a multi-polygon to represent that. But more on that uh, in the workshop. Okay, Alice? Yes. So just a quick reminder to, um, to everyone, we have the DHS2 annual conference coming up from 21st to 25th June. It's basically the largest event of the year. Um, last year, we had nine, over 900 participants. So we aim at having even more participants this year. So if you want to get some updates on the latest um, innovations um, and hear some very interesting use cases from all around the world, basically, um, I just shared the link in the chat. So click on it and do not hesitate to register. Obviously, it will be fully digital also this year. And we have also a call for presentation proposals. So if you want to share with the entire community your experience, your use of DHIS2, do not hesitate to submit your presentation proposal. And you will get, uh, you will hear from us um, by mid-May. We also have the web and Android app competition. So if uh, we have any developers who want to share their innovative work, development work, please go on the page. You can read all the criteria and you can also submit your, your project for the app competition. That's it. Thank you so much. Okay, thank you all. I see that we are already a little bit over time, but almost on time, there are no new questions, you can still use this page and ask questions and we will try to answer them or say if that is something we will cover in the workshop. So I just want to say thank you for joining. I hope it has been useful and I hope to see most of you on the two days workshop where you can practice on yourself and we can, can go more in, in detail. Thank you. <laughs>